Welcome everyone to Calvary Conversations. I am your host for this episode, Joshua Paxton, director of the Burnham Center for Global Engagement here at Calvary and associate professor of intercultural studies. And with me today is Valerie Percy, uh, almost Dr. Valerie Percy. She's she's just about there, so she's going to beat me to it, unfortunately. But yeah. You know, so. It's not a race, right? It's not a race, right, Valerie? So, no. uh, Valerie is the director of the Clark Academic Center here at Calvary University. She's also the program director for our professional directed studies program. And she also teaches in a variety of roles at Calvary. She teaches in the education program, the English program, and also the, the master's in counseling program. Uh, so now, Valerie, before coming to Calvary, uh, you served as a missionary. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your, your missionary service. Okay. Well, um, when I did my undergrad at Baptist Bible College, I wanted to be a missionary. So I took mission classes along with a minor in music and a minor in children's ministry. Um, and so when I finished there, um, I was not one of those who got married. I It just didn't happen. Um, didn't find the right person then. So, um, and you can survive college and, you know, not get married. It can happen. Um, so, I did, I'm with you. I did too. So, yep. Yeah, it possible. can happen and you can still be a whole person. It's, it's possible. Um, so, I kind of, I wanted to do a short-term type of mission Thing that had just actually opened up um, through the Baptist Bible Fellowship International. Um, and so there was somebody who had reached out to my pastor who is from Uganda. They needed someone to come over and train their teachers and work with uh, ESL. So I, I went. I didn't know these people. I didn't know anything about Uganda. Um, and I lived there for two years and I learned the language very quickly. Um, it was Riancole. I worked with the Ancole tribe. Um, and then I went throughout the country training teachers, particularly with like developing Sunday school curriculum um, and developing a Sunday school at large. They don't have Sunday schools there at all. Um, mm -hmm. That's a foreign concept. So trying to teach them how to begin with the youngest and all the way to the oldest. So from like Genesis to Romans and teaching them how to use their developmental abilities and teach to those, you know, in their own language yeah. um, and right. writing so. out the curriculums. Yeah, so that's what I did. Um, and it was, while I was there, I actually worked on a language curriculum, um, which brought in my linguistics background. I really enjoyed that. Um, it was something that was needful and I just, it's a one year guide to teaching Riancole to expats. So they still use it and they actually use it at BBC as curriculum. So it's kind of, it, it was something that needed to be done. I just did it and um, it helped me learn the language, so. Excellent, so maybe we'll get, uh, maybe we'll get you to make a linguistics program here at Calvary, right? You so, never know. <laughs> right? Let's see if I can talk you into that, so. So now Valerie, you went, you went to the mission field as as a single lady. Um, you know, for a lot of ladies that are considering going into missions, that can be a concern. So, how how was that for you? What what encouragement might you have for somebody who's in that position, thinking about going into missions, and you know, maybe a little worried about that? Well, there were a couple of things I would say to that. One is. Um, you don't need a man to fulfill you. Okay. <laughs> There's a verse in first Corinthians. Um, it's in the second chapter, I think that talks about how that we're complete in Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, and that verse really helped me throughout that because it helped me realize that he can fulfill all that I absolutely need. And that, whenever God would bring a husband into my life, that would be like the cream on top of the cake, right? That I already have everything I need in Christ. So anything above that is just nice. Yeah. Um, and learning to allow God to be that fulfillment in me. Um, so that time period when I was in Africa, I used a lot of that time to kind of work on me, mm -hmm. um, which was good because God did bring someone to me just later. 
And um, and I was already very confident in who I was in Christ. And that helped prepare me for that later on in life. Um, but to get myself over there as a single lady, I did do deputation. And um, I will say this, there's there are some pastors who are willing to put money behind a single woman, especially when you show them what it is you're going to do. And uh -huh. having that confidence is very important. Yes. Um, and showing that, that you are a asset to a ministry and being confident in that. Um, are there pastors sometimes that don't maybe support that? Yeah, there are, um, unfortunately. Um, but I will say, be confident in what God has called you to do. Um, and when you go over there, wherever that is, be confident, but also be a learner, be a servant, um, be adaptable. I had to change and do all sorts of things that I never thought I would be doing. Um, and I learned through that process. I was a different person coming home than when I oh, went. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, and um, were there, you know, throughout history, there have been tons of, of single female missionaries. Um Gosh, Amy Carmichael, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of them. So have were you inspired by by any of those who went before you? Yeah. Speaking of like Amy Carmichael and Elizabeth Elliott, um, you know, I always have loved their stories, particularly Elizabeth Elliott. I used to think I really studied her a lot in college because I thought, you know, she went back to the people after her husband had passed away. And yes, I thought, you know. She didn't let circumstances define her. She didn't, you know, she could have very easily just changed her mind and moved on with her life and her child. But she went back and did an amazing work with the people um, that her husband actually had died from, you know. And I, I, that's amazing to me. And I think there's a verse that talks about how when you're single, there you can invest your entire life doing ministry. That's Paul, and, yeah, that's Paul talking about the uh, the unmarried. He's he says man, but the unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. Um, the married man is concerned about how he can please his wife. Yeah, right. And you know, you're single for a purpose. And mm -hmm. I read this book that was talking about. It's called uh, I can't remember now, but anyway, it's about doing using the time that God has given you to be single, however long that is, for mm -hmm. His purpose. And mm -hmm allowing that time to be something really amazing. And in those two years that I was there, I did a lot of things. Now, being married now, I couldn't do all of that. I don't have time. I have three yeah, kids, yeah, working yeah. a job, you know, and it's true. God has you single for a very specific reason. And I was there to do something and I saw things that also need to be done and I just did it because I was single. I had all this time. I had the time to do it. Was I tired after two years? I was. But it was a very enriching time for me. And it actually paved the way to doing some of the things I'm doing now. I had no idea. Yeah. I never thought I was going to be a teacher. Never. But here I am, and I love it. it. God opened my eyes during that time to see that he had given me a gift that I never knew I had. And so when you're single, use that time for whatever it is God's trying to teach you and show you, because you're not going to have that time back. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So and it's very true. You know, yeah, once you once you get married and you have kids and uh, the the busyness and, you know, you naturally have to commit time to those relationships. And so that leaves you unable to commit time to other things. So. Amen. That's a great perspective and a great perspective for our students to have as well as they're thinking about it. So uh, so now you're very involved in teaching English to speakers of other languages. And so you've written a curriculum that that was an aspect of your ministry. And so uh, maybe you could explain a little bit for our listeners what that is. And then if there is somebody out there who's thinking about moving in that direction, what steps would you recommend for them to take? Okay, so when I was in college, you know, there was a track that we either had to take uh, four semesters of language, like Spanish or something like that, or linguistics. 
And I wasn't sure where I was going. So I didn't feel like God was leading me towards Spanish. I had taken some Spanish in high school. So I figured let's, I'm not going to do that. I kind of have an idea of Spanish. So I took linguistics, which I had no idea what that was. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. Um, but I was immersed in the linguistics world and um, I loved it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a very logical person by, by nature and linguistics to me made so much sense because it's like a puzzle. Um, grammar is universal, okay? All languages have subjects and verbs and, but not all, not all languages might have adjectives, not all languages mm -hmm. might have pronouns, things like that. So it's like you're figuring out each language and putting in place where these nouns are or verbs, they might be over here or they might be over here and you figure it out and then once you put the puzzle together, you can learn the language. So it allows people to learn languages quicker mm -hmm. when you understand them. So I love that because for me, learning the language, I, I can learn it quicker when I understand why. Why do they put the E at the end instead of at the beginning or, you know, just figuring it out. So yeah. I studied hundreds of languages when I was doing that. Uh, we would develop like a dictionary for it. We would, you know, understand the rudiments of the language. Um, mm -hmm. Some very difficult ones, even ones like Arabic and Russian and, you know, all these different kinds that even had different alphabets than ours. But it was, I loved it. It was intriguing. Um, so having some type of background in language, I think is important um, when you're gonna go do something even like ESL, because you need to understand how they learn language before you teach them our language. Because oh, our language, the thing is with English, we're a mutt language is what I say, because we're a mixture of all languages. In fact, we're one of the hardest languages to teach. So it's important and to, to learn. Yeah, because yeah, it's very I mean, hard. On. There, there, there. Yeah, we have, <laughs> we have, you know, the exception for every rule. And it's because we have a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this and a bit of that all mixed in. Um, and so that's what makes it very difficult for people of other languages to learn our language. So understanding their language, where they're coming from, like Spanish, for instance, why they put something in front of another one and understanding that's why they want to say the before every word, because they do L or la before every word. Yeah. You know, understanding the language while you're teaching them is very helpful. So I would encourage someone to take linguistic classes before you, when you're taking TESOL. Mm -hmm. um, that would be one of my recommendations. But also having a TESOL background, that's number two. You need to take TESOL classes, even if it's a certificate, because it's teaching you how to teach people of other languages. Um, it mostly is un understanding culture, how that is part of your classroom. Um, it also talks about how language is associated with their culture. I mean, when you learn someone's language, like when I went overseas and I actually learned Riancole, the people there uh, felt respected by me because very few of the missionaries over there actually learned their language. They've been there 15, 20 years and all they knew were the greetings, but I didn't, I knew more. I'll give you an example. When you show an interest in learning it and then you actually do, yes, that speaks volumes of how you value them as a people. Right, so one thing I decided to do when I was over there to learn the language is I would walk every day. I didn't drive my car. I would walk probably two miles to where I taught. And walking, I'd walk by all these little houses and huts and all this stuff, and I would talk the whole way. I would greet oh, everybody. I would, and it, it forced me to learn the language. Yeah. And every Saturday I would go to the market and I would order everything I wanted in the language and they would correct me all the time and they would laugh at me and I would laugh at myself but it it made me learn the language learn it yeah so yeah. one time there's this little corner where all these guys on on bikes they call them boda boda guys because they, what they would do is they would give you a ride on the back of the bike well these boys sometimes would be very they would say nasty things you know like oh baby come here you know that kind of thing well, I learned a phrase that would basically tell them that I was going to tell their mama on them. And I learned it in Rian Cole. And so the next time they said it, I did. I wagged my finger at them just like a mama would do. And I said that. 
their eyes got really big and they're like, oh, you know Riancole. And I was like, yes, and you stop, that's rude. And I said it all in Riancole. They <laughs> never said it to me again. Oh, I bet, yeah. And I was known as the yellow haired woman who knows Riancole. That whole town knew me as a woman who knows Riancole. And you know, they started like, they would come to me. They wouldn't go sometimes, sometimes to the other missionaries because I knew the language. And I'd only been there a few months. So, I mean, it's important that you understand their language. It's important that you try because your your students will understand, will be more likely to learn the language if you have a background in learning languages. Yeah, That's one thing you need to do is learn other languages. Yeah, so excellent, excellent. So, you know, you mentioned uh, the intersection of language and culture. And so uh, coming up this cycle two, three, I'll be teaching. Um, I don't know. Sorry, it's in the spring. Uh, I'll be teaching cross-cultural communication. And that's one of the things that we discuss in that class is how the you know language. It's almost a circular language defines the culture. The culture determines the language and so forth right. and so on. And so as you were as you were there, were there were there things that stuck out to you? That was like, OK, this this aspect of the culture is here because of the way they speak, because of the way their language is structured. Does that question make sense? Yeah. OK, so for instance, on these walks, when I would greet people in America, we just say, hi, how are you? Right. And our normal well, we say, how are you? Fine. And we keep walking. Yeah, we just say fine, even if we're not fine, because no one really wants to stand there and hear the whole explanation, right? Yeah. OK, so in their culture, though, that's not the case. I might be talking to a stranger and I will ask them how they are and they're actually going to tell me how they are, even though they don't know me and I don't know them. And then I have to go further and ask about their wife and their children, and then they're going to tell me that, too. And then I go further and I ask about their cows because they're cattle people. And I ask about their fam family in the, you know, some bush you know, their village. And then I asked further. I mean, it is a long conversation of greetings. It's not just how are you? Yes, because that's what they expect. And then they're going to ask me the same thing. Um, so I literally had to stop and talk to somebody, which for me, I'm from Rhode Island. OK, so I'm used to much faster paced life. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn. It was hard for me to just stop. Time meant nothing there at all. <laughs> and relationship was everything yes. and you can see it in their language by just the greetings person it was very person. yeah it was very important for me to stop and i had to learn just to put things down when somebody came to the house and have tea <laughs> and just talk and it was hard at first um and i had to tell remind myself all the time just stop it's okay if you don't get it done yeah. who cares was it was it difficult coming back to the United States after two years when you had learned to slow down and now you come back here and our culture is very much go, 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 go? Yeah, it it was um, I think my biggest uh, part of coming back was television because I didn't have it there um, and seeing how bad it was. That was really hard. Um, the other thing was choice like when i went into a grocery store i had to leave because there was like we were walking up an aisle and they had all the cereal in uganda there were two choices of cereal there were like cornflakes and something like shredded wheat they were called wheat of wheat of bix but the more like wheat of bricks we used to joke around about it that was it and so when i went up the aisle i was just like i was with my dad and i was like i have to go <laughs> i can't it was just overwhelming um and a lot of missionaries say that because it's just it's too much. So it's busy, you know, the overstimulation. Um, but yeah, the busyness, you know, it it took me a little bit to just kind of get back into the uh, swing of things. I will say one thing I did like was blending in mm. and people not pointing at me all the time. Yeah. And driving. I could drive on the road and people actually followed rules. I liked that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes, it's true. It's true.
it's true. So it's interesting. It's it's funny you mentioned, you know, in Uganda, the greeting kind of thing. So um, we had an adjunct professor here, Norm Baker, uh, who was a missionary with Avant in Mali, and he was began teaching me Bambara. Uh, and it's very similar where you greet someone and it's how are you? How is your wife? How is your, you know, how's your brother, your sister, your uncle, your niece, your grandma, your cow, your pig, your and and you have to do this it's the cultural thing that you have to go all the way through this. If you were to, you know, if you were to follow the American pattern of wait, 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 I don't have time. Everyone's fine. OK, it's it's like, well, you just killed your relationship with that person yeah. because you didn't you didn't follow the pattern even to um, like somebody might come up to you and say and you talk about how we say, how are you? It's fine. You know, when even if we're not well, within this greeting somebody might say something like how are you fine how's your wife fine how's your kids fine and then after they get through the greeting the person will turn around and be like oh by the way my wife died two days ago and it's you know for us it's like but you just said they were fine yeah. but it's the same kind of that's what's expected that's yeah. the that's the expected answer so all right um so so valerie what uh, tell me what do you most enjoy about working at calvary um i would say i mean i've worked in all sorts of colleges both public and private and now christian colleges and i will say that i've really enjoyed um the people who work here mm -hmm. um they're friendly and there's not a lot of gossiping and stuff like that, which I appreciate. That's good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I've come from places where it's like just a this thing always going on and you can't talk because you might be part of that gossip chain. And <laughs> so I, I appreciate that about Calvary. Mm -hmm. um, I also love the students. Um, I mean, I've always loved my students no matter where I am, but I like that the students are joyful and that um, even if it's a very early morning for class, they still have a smile, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I do love that about, you know, actually getting to see my students. I've taught a lot of online classes, so it's nice to be in the classroom again and see students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. So it was nice to get nice to get back in the classroom after spring break this past year. So yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, so are there any projects that you're currently working on your maybe first you're you're about to get your doctorate what are you writing your dissertation on um well i you know i'm getting ready to defend so it should be done soon thankfully but my dissertation was on um a certain dis a certain district public school districts um method of how they teach writing using writing skills like um, student self-assessment with adolescent ELL students. So it was really seeing how teachers teach writing um, because there's not a lot out there about adolescent ELL students and we're finding that these students aren't ready for college writing. And define, so define ELL students for our they, okay. they, may not, they may not understand that. Yeah, English language learners. Mm -hmm. So um, we're finding the, that a lot of districts, um, and this district has 80% uh, English language learners. Yeah. So this is, we're talking about middle school and high school. Um, and we don't have a lot of, these students will, they'll get in there like first time, okay? First time getting into the classroom, uh, they don't speak English. They don't write any of that. Um, and they're basically put into the regular classrooms. And so they're not ready for college rigor, um, mostly in reading and in writing. And so we're trying to figure out, OK, so how can we help these teachers? Because they don't have enough ESL teachers to actually get them ready. So they may see an ESL teacher once a day, but the rest of the time they're with a, you know, a math teacher or history teacher. And so how can we better help these teachers? And so my push was really to talk about professional development. So in interviewing the ESL teachers and things like that, they're asking for more professional development, which honestly is the teachers, these ESL teachers teaching the other teachers. Mm, yeah. So that's kind of what that was about. Um, and then for 
what I'm working on currently here at Calvary. Um, I'm working with uh, Tim Hange and you, Josh, uh, to start an English Pathways minor, which mm-hmm. hasn't really been done before. So I worked. No, but we're excited of, about it. Yeah, I've worked with a lot of ESOL programs, which ESOL is a little bit different. English speakers of other languages. Um, that's what that means in it. That's usually for people who are wanting to go to college, um, but their TOEFL is too low, and so they can't earn credit toward college. So they'll have to take these classes and then try again to get into college. I've worked in those kinds of programs. And I've also worked with adult ed. Yeah, real real quick for our for our listeners, the TOEFL is a test that non-native English speakers will take before entering college to determine their English ability mm-hmm. uh, to be able to learn in in a college in the, the United States. So, right. Sorry. It's Go a ahead. required. Yeah, it's a required test. So I taught in those kind of situations. And then there's another one called adult ed, which are for people who just want to learn English and they're adults. So they're ma- they usually aren't ones who want to go to college. They just need to learn it in order to survive. Um, so with the ESOL classes, we're wanting to do something a little bit different where these learners will take the TOEFL coming in um, and then learn, actually gain some, a minor, just like you would like a Spanish minor in college, just be in our program and use those classes toward a minor. Mm -hmm. And then they'll take the TOEFL at the end and be able to take classes here at Calvary. So we're working on developing that and we hope to have it ready by January if we can. Um, So we're very excited about it. Um, I think it'll be a really good program. And, you know, there's a lot of here in Kansas City, we have a lot of uh, a a good population. So I think we can reach out to some of our there's a lot of churches um, that are diverse and different people groups. So I think that we can, you know, really have a good marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the maybe part of the real significance of this is rather than just being like a certificate, um, it's, it's a minor. And so these students are coming or they're already here, you know, children of immigrants or refugees in the Kansas city area, and they can get this minor in English, which if they, they go back to their country of origin at some point, the having that is going to just, greatly increase their marketability as they're looking for jobs and you know looking to support themselves right. and their families so yeah that's right happening. so it, it kind of ties in almost with my dissertation because we're finding these students aren't ready for college yeah um, so they could come into our program earn credit toward college as a minor but be also learning English that will get them ready for this college rigor that they're not quite ready so it's kind of building that gap yep. we're trying to fill that need Yep, absolutely. So that's great. Uh, Well, if you heard that beeping while you were talking there, that was my other screen telling me that our time is up for today. But uh, Valerie, thank you for joining us for Calvary Conversations. It's great to talk with you and uh, share you with the the broader Calvary world so uh, that they're aware of some of the great people that we have working here and helping to prepare uh, our students. So thank you for being with us today. No problem. So, all right, guys. Well, that's all we have time for today. God bless. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Calvary Conversations, a service of Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. We invite you to participate in the conversation by contacting us through the Calvary University website, calvary.edu, or by calling us at 816-322-0110. Join us again next week for another Calvary Conversation.